Um, and so, you know, from Al Qaeda's view, the more that that commitment can be, you know, I mean, they're trying to pull off what Bin Laden did by saying, you know, Al Qaeda is here, uh, you know, Ali Abdullah Saleh, you know, um, the only way you can defeat this is is accepting more uh, military and intelligence and you know support and and so forth that will further compromise him in the eyes of Yemenis and and so forth. Um, so, so I'd think uh, on the Yemeni front, given you know his his weakness that uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh's weakness that. Um, you know, I mean, I, th I think the administration is doing the right thing and trying to come to play this very low key. And uh, but um, but it's uh, you know, if if Al Qaeda can can further ratchet up their anxieties in Western media, which they 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 can do to some extent, and I think that's why uh, it's important. Peter's statement that you know this is uh, that Al Qaeda is the past. I think that's that's a very important message to continually remind ourselves, um, and, and that's part of this battle. We have six minutes left and lots of questions, so we're going to have to be more efficient about our answers. Okay, um, over here. Hello, I'm David Tarr from journalist of Danish um, at Danish Daily Berlingske Tidene. Um, I just have a question. Um, you telling that Al-Qaeda might be a thing of the past, but are they aware of that? Are they getting less ambitious slash uh, realistic about their goals? Um, the, what I'm about to say also responds to the previous question. Um, some of the recent statements that I've been reading by Atiyatullah and, and Al-Zawahiri, they are talking about what's really going well for them is actually the economic crises in the United States and, and in Europe. They're claiming that these are some of the consequences of of the 9-11 attacks, and, and, and this, is, this they see as a plus. Um, one of the things that they are claiming victory over is the decision of the United States to withdraw from from Afghanistan, so uh, um, this is this is how the the rhetoric, as far as they're concerned, is 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 going. I think the landscape of Afghanistan and Pakistan is different from the Middle East, and I think this is this is a potentially different, uh, uh, more more threatening situation than it is in the Middle East. Also, I think um, you know, and to some extent. It seems like your question is imagining a kind of a subset of specific people who are Al Qaeda members and a kind of a, you know, um, uh, this affiliate cells well organized. But I mean, Al Qaeda is, you know, again a tactic. It's part of a part of a war. It's part of a way of uh, of marketing and, and attracting financing and and uh, uh, you know. Um, so if it's a tactic that works, right, they'll 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 continue to use it. But if it's if it's one that's flailing as it is now, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, it's one that won't work for them. In the back there. Rothman, Ari Rothman, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Peter, my question is for you. Um, your advice sounded like stopping a course of antibiotics just because it's done as opposed to running the course that the doctor ordered. How do we know that the demise of Al-Qaeda is not a product of our vigilance as opposed to their own bankruptcy. And in an applied sense, if we turn our attentions away from the fight against Al-Qaeda or jihadi terrorism, how do we prevent the resurgence, sort of the way when we turned our attentions away from Afghanistan after the end of the Soviet occupation, we ended up with Al-Qaeda? Well, I'm certainly not advocating an end for our presence in Afghanistan. Um, I'm just talking about a, perhaps a recalibration of the way we look at the world. I mean, um, I, think, I think it's inarguable at this point that Al-Qaeda doesn't pose a national security threat to the United States, by which I would mean an attack that would, let's say, get us to reformulate our national security policy as 9-11 did. It represents something like an Oklahoma City threat, which obviously, you know, is a fairly big deal but is not, um, it's a second order threat. Um, so if, the, if we accept the, that proposition, which I think at this point is sort of inarguable, and that's to do with both our vigilance, as you point out, and also their own weaknesses, um, it's not an argument to sort of just say, you know, to, to stop paying attention to them, but um, as the sort of principal organizing uh, 
um, idea of our national security policy, I think we can kind of move on. And by the way, we'd be doing ourselves a favor, um, you know, not treating these guys as an existential threat. Uh, we know they aren't, <laughs> so why continue pretending they are? And, and, and very few people at this point, I think, are, are suggesting that they are. So, but that said, of course, we don't want to abandon Afghanistan. We did that in 1989. We kind of did it again in 2002 in a sort of modified form. Um, so that's, I, I guess that's my somewhat um, complicated answer to that question. Alexander Hitchens, uh, ICSR, King's College. Um, my question is mainly for Dr. Cook. Um, you mentioned uh, Al-Wala al bara is uh, one of the sort of corner cornerstones of Salafi jihadist uh, thought. But of course, it's also, as, as, as you know, uh, uh, quite an important part of Salafism more generally, um, coming from Ibn Taymiyyah and, and, and along the way up until Makdisi. Um, so with that in mind, uh, to what extent do you think Salafism, more generally, is part of the problem, rather than specifically Salafi jihadism? And I guess I'll frame that question around the debate about who we should be engaging with domestically uh, in terms of uh, partners who will be confronting this issue. And many people believe Salafis and Islamists have a role to play. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, Salafism definitely has both a quietist and an activist side. Uh, probably Abu Muhammad al-Maqdisi best exemplifies that, somebody who has moved back and forth all across, the, uh, across the spectrum. I do feel like we should definitely engage with quietist Salafis, although it, you should not be unaware of the fact that they can move towards an activism. I think that, that basically that's what we're seeing with, uh, with things like Boko Haram, even as we're speaking. Uh, the move away from uh, from kind of a quietist attitude towards an activist one. But I think that on their quietist side, I believe that, that Salafis can be engaged from a theological and a political point of view um, and encouraged, because Salafism in the end is an exhausting uh, belief system. It, it, it's very it's very ascetic and, and hard line. And I think that um, the move towards quietism on the part of somebody like, like Muxtasi does actually reflect his age. Uh, as a young man, he was more of a firebrand. Today, he's more of an elder statesman and so forth. So people like him, uh, although we also must be cautious of them, I think that they can be engaged and used to, over a period of time, uh, deal with the, with the excesses of youth. Um, people do respect Muxtasi. I mean, he's gone through a lot. He's been in prison and so forth. And uh, the fact that he has moved away from, uh, from the excesses of Zarqawi and others, um, and has been so openly critical of them, has, I think, had an effect. That should not be disregarded just because we uh, dislike his other political or religious opinions. Great, it's 1700, so we're in US military time. It's time to finish. And uh, thank you to our panelists. Well, let me add my thanks to, uh, to the panel and to Peter Bergen. I have just a couple of announcements. For those of you who have been um, taking the, uh, the three records that we had produced for you today, um, we are continuing to produce those, so if you've been disappointed that there were no longer any there, um, as long as you keep taking them, we will keep producing them. We were just trying to save a little bit of your taxpayer money by not producing too many. The other thing that I have to offer you is, is that hopefully by the end of tonight, if the NDU website is working, there will actually be 12 documents, just again as a small sample of what the archive holds. Those will be up on the internet in both Arabic and in English. 
I also have to offer you for the very first time um, in hard copy, there'll be copies out here, and again, as you keep taking them, we'll keep producing them. This will be the first time that an index is available to what we have in the archives so far. What's significant about that is it's cleaned up, it should have clean titles. This is the index of the archive as it exists today. And our mission at the CRRC is con to continue to grow it. So I hope you'll continue to look at that. That will be up on the website as well. There may be two versions. Look for the PDF version. The other version is a truncated thing that won't be useful to you. And I should mention, too, that in conjunction with the conference that we'll hold with the Woodrow Wilson Center at the end of October on the Iran-Iraq War, we'll have an index of the Saddam Hussein collection. So that is not available just yet, but will be then. In terms of what will happen for the rest of this evening, for those of you who have dinner in red on your badges, please join us for the reception that will be back at the atrium at Marshall Hall and then dinner. And our dinner speaker, C. Michael Hurley. And for the rest of you that had, don't have the red dinner on your badge, if you would like to join us at 6.30 for Michael Hurley's talk, you'd be certainly welcome to join us then. And for all of you, if you're leaving now, please come back tomorrow because we have a great panel tomorrow and a great closing speaker. So thank you again for your attention today.